Okay, we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I wanted to first just welcome all of our admitted students and families to Scripps College's Virtual Admitted Student Week. This is our kickoff event. Um, and my name is Laura Stratton. I am the Director of Admission here at Scripps. So just a few housekeeping things before we get started with Amy, Marcus Newhall, who is our Dean of Faculty. Um, on the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a Q&A function. And while Amy and I are going to have a conversation for a few minutes um, here, probably about 15, 20 minutes, we are eager to know what your questions are. And so you can utilize that question and answer um, function at the bottom of your Zoom. If for some reason we don't get to your question, um, feel free to reach out to us on the Virtual Admitted Student Hub to email admission at Scripps College or to send us a text. And so feel free to follow up with us. Um, and then Amy's also gonna provide her contact information to follow up as well. So um, I first of all just wanna say thank you to Amy for being here with us today. Thank you for joining me for this conversation and sharing a little bit more about academics at Scripps. I think a good place to start is just to tell us a little bit more about you and your role at the college. Hello and welcome everybody. I have to say I was just thinking in my head this is like a rock concert without an audience or an NBA basketball game without an audience because I am talking but I don't get to see any of you which is a quite unusual experience uh, for me. Anyway, that being said, welcome. And first and foremost, congratulations to all of the students who are listening uh, for the great success you have had and the hard work you have uh, pursued in high school and before to not only be accepted to Scripps, but I'm sure to many other colleges. It is a hard process and you deserve lots of congratulations. And for you, the family members who are on this call, um, as a parent myself, I applaud you for supporting and engaging with your student during this process. So congratulations to you as well. It is a true shame that we are not on campus um, during this time. This is a different um, admissions yield process for us, as you can see behind both myself and Lara. We have these beautiful um, Scripps pictures, but that is nothing like the actual Scripps College. So it is just simply a shame and we are all adjusting to the current situation. I also wanna let you know that I truly empathize with the place that you find yourself right now. And I always love the distinction between empathize and sympathize. Um, sympathize means you haven't experienced it, but you feel for somebody and empathize means you really know. So I have twins who are seniors in high school right now. So I truly empathize with where you are as families in making these decisions. I will say that I've got one knocked off because he decided early decision, uh, but I have another, um, a daughter who is currently deciding among her three or four top choices. So, uh, I do understand and I am happy at the end, as, as Laura said, to answer questions uh, that you might have at this time. So I am Amy Marcus Newhall. I am the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty. I have been at Scripps College for 28 years now, and I will say a wonderful and glorious 28 years as opposed to I've been stuck here by any means. Um, I could imagine no other career and I could not be happier. Uh, I was for 18 years in the psychology department um, teaching and then um, 10 years ago I moved into the administration and I have been nine years of the Dean of Faculty and one of those years I actually served as the interim president as we searched for um, our fabulous president who you will meet later this week if you have not already, Lara Tiedens. Um, I want this session to be as authentic and honest and transparent as possible. So I will do my best, that's simply who I am. And so I will do my best to stay that way throughout this session. I will have to say right up front, I am a social psychologist. And one of my areas of research when I was practicing was about prejudice and bias. And I will simply say, as you've already noted, I am biased about scripts. I love it. It's the place for me I want to convey all the wonders and beauties about Scripps College to you and hope that it becomes the place for you, but know that it may or may not be. And also for you to think about your home away from home. Um, I have an older daughter who went to college and I remember when we were first taking her on trips to visit various colleges, um, they used to say, okay, here will be your new home. And I remember saying, hey, I used to say that also, but she has a home and this is not her new home. So I am very clear that 
should you as a family, should your student decide on scripts, this will be a wonderful, fabulous home away from home. All of that being said, and before I get into the wonders of scripts and the academic scripts, clearly you are all thinking the same kinds of questions that I am about our current pandemic and what's going on and how we're thinking about the summer, the fall and moving forward. And I really wanna to say to you, we're doing everything strategically that we possibly can and and there are so many unknowns and over the next several months we will get more and more information to help us figure out what decisions we should be making our greatest hope and desire is to have a normal fall semester um, but we are following the advice of public officials government local la county and we will do what is the safest not only for your students our students but public as well so what the public um, issues today have done for me is to truly reinforce the value of a liberal arts college as we think about what we're experiencing as we think about solutions flexibility creativity strategic these are all the kinds of thinkings that we all need to deal with this current situation and it's exactly what we at scripps thrive to provide for our students okay with that being said I think we are transitioning on, and I think Laura has a question for me. It's a great segue, Amy, because when you talk about a liberal arts education and in challenging times and, and in great times, um, there are some real benefits to being at a liberal arts college. So as a longtime faculty member, as our dean of faculty, what do you see as those benefits um, for students who are considering attending a liberal arts college? Well, let me say that I can speak from experience. Um, I attended a liberal arts college nearby to the Claremont Colleges as an undergraduate. And once I decided that I wanted to pursue higher education, I knew there would be no place for me other than a liberal arts education. That being said, the question is why? And there are so many reasons, but a liberal arts education to me is a, a, a pedagogy, a method of teaching, and also a real value. So first and foremost, it teaches us how to think. I think of the brain as a muscle. And when you do, when you're exercising, you build up your muscles. And so that's what we do with education. We build up our brain muscle by the way we engage with ideas and think about thoughts and pursue ideas and disagree with others. And so it is about how to think, how to think differently, how to think out of the box, how to question. It's also about how to learn. That is, learning is a lifelong endeavor. It's about an ever-changing world. And so learning a set of facts are important, but that's not enough. One needs to learn how to think about facts as the world evolves. One needs to think about a process for thinking as opposed to just data and numbers. So that's what a liberal arts college is really all about. What we do is we teach both breadth and depth at Scripps College, and later on I'll go more into specific programming, but neither alone will suffice. One needs to get into the meat of the issue. One needs to think deeply about what you're talking about while simultaneously broadly expanding one's repertoire. At a liberal arts college, you don't get to just come and take one class. What we're gonna do is push you into taking classes that you might not do with our general education requirements. We see this as a huge benefit and we hope that students who come do as well. But it's not enough to say, I love psychology, which I do, but that's all I'm gonna take because my knowledge of psychology becomes so much more valued and rich by taking other classes that play into that and help me think about psychology in different ways. Clearly the value of a liberal arts college is small classes and being taught directly by faculty, engaging with faculty in and out of the classroom, challenging worldviews, thinking through ideas together, one-on-one -on -one in small groups, again, inside and outside of the classroom. I gotta do one thing as a psychologist, which is show you a little bit of data from a study. Um, so a study years ago, I don't know, five years ago or something, questioned a thousand graduates of, of various colleges. They did this 10, 20, and 40 years after graduation. And they had a liberal arts cohort, and they had randomly assigned students from other colleges. 
And I'm just gonna give you a couple of key factors. Those students who graduated from liberal arts colleges were 30 to 100% more likely to show leadership skills. Liberal arts students who graduated were 26 to 66% more likely to contribute to society by volunteering, by charitable giving, by engaging in their local communities. So those are just two very important statistics of what liberal arts colleges seem to do more so than other types of colleges. Also, there's a famous book by Robert Harris called On the Purpose of a Liberal Education. And he says, quote, a cultivated mind enjoys itself and life and knowledge makes you smarter and smarter makes you happier. Now it's true that happiness is not the only goal, but I gotta say for my life, it's one goal and it's an important goal because you can have a lot of things, but if you don't have happiness, then those things are really unimportant. So it's been shown that people who are highly educated have higher satisfaction in life. And clearly that is what Scripps continues your path along to success. Now you might ask about jobs and financial security, and these two are correlated with liberal arts colleges. And they're correlated with liberal arts colleges because of things that I've said before. What does a liberal arts college provide? Critical thinking, ability to be flexible, strategic thinking, creative thinking, independent thinking. So they become, folks who graduate from liberal arts colleges become leaders in professions because they do not just do the job, they think about it and do it better. And I often hear from alums, Scripps alums who get back in touch with me say, you know, I started the job kind of at the bottom level. And then within two years, I was promoted three times because each time someone gave me a task to do, I didn't simply do it. What I did was I questioned it and I came up with an alternative way. And they really thought that was good. They didn't want it just to be done. So clearly you can tell that I am enthusiastic about a liberal arts college. <laughs> so one of the things that I really appreciate, Amy, about working at Scripps is the broader Claremont Colleges. We already have some questions coming in about that. What do you see as some of the benefits of the five college environment for Scripps students? Okay, here's my psychologist in me again. Many of you probably know the Gestalt quote, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That is the epitome of Scripps College and the Claremont Colleges. Um, as I said, I went to a phenomenal, you can ask me this later if you want to know where, but a wonderful standalone liberal arts college. And I still love it. I'm still engaged with it. But there is something so fabulously wonderful about the Claremont Colleges. What you have is a standalone, wonderful liberal arts college, small, with all of the benefits, and a consortium that provides a mid-sized research university with more classes to be offered, more majors, of majors available, more faculty to work with, more lectures to go to, more events to participate in, more co-curricular activities. And what I would say is Scripps is fabulous and the Claremont Colleges make Scripps even more fabulous if that is possible. Um, so clearly it's the best of both worlds and um, there are so many examples of this. Now, that is not to say that it works 100% of the time. We can all do better in what we're doing. Let me give you a couple of examples where it struggles a little bit or whether your student might want to think about it. So for example, we have an economics major at Scripps. If your student is a Scripps student and wants to major in economics at CMC, that's not possible because we have an economics major. Can they take classes at CMC? Absolutely. Can every student who wants to take a class on one of the other campuses always get in? No, that is not the case. We all give priority to our own students first, but we open up our classes so there are always other students in our classes. That being said, what you can do is major in something that we don't have the major for. So for example, Scripps doesn't have a sociology, but you can major in, at Pomona or Pitzer for that. Now, you may be wondering, because this is kind of the talk of the town about computer science, and so I'm just gonna say it right up front, two colleges have computer science, Pomona and Harvey Mudd, the rest of us don't have those as majors, and they're burdened. There are so many students who want computer science that our students, we are working consortially on this, and our students, a few can get into Harvey Mudd. Pomona has kind of put a halt on right now because they can't satisfy their own. But what we're doing at Scripps is not only working consortially for students who might 
be able to major in computer science off campus, but to provide those resources about coding and computing on campus. We now have a minor in data, data science at Scripps College. We have lots of, we've developed lots of intro computer science courses. So even when there are like complications, what we do is come up with workarounds to make sure that students can get the classes that they want. Going back to the benefits of the consortium, as I said, more classes, more research opportunities, more lectures, um, lots of resources at, for example, we have intercollegiate majors that are actually across the five colleges. And so environmental analysis, you can do across the colleges. So all of that to be said, um, I, I'm a huge advocate. I really do think going back to the beginning, it is the best of both worlds. You have all the benefits as of a small liberal arts college with all of the resources and the benefits of a mid-size college slash research university. So Amy, we both know as longtime members of the Scripps community that Scripps is an amazing place in its own right. What aspects of the Scripps academic community do you think really make it special? Well, if you have a couple of hours, I could do this. No, I will, I will um, do the highlights here. Um, so what I really believe makes Scripps unique and different, other than being a fabulous liberal arts college, which many are there throughout the United States, is what I call the academic bookends. And what that means is at the beginning of a student's career is a three semester interdisciplinary humanities core program. And at the other end of the bookend in the senior year is a required senior thesis. So let me just tell you a little bit about those. And there's something in the middle too. But our three semester core program is something that whether it's been three semesters or two semesters or four semesters has been a highlight of script since its inception. And it is interdisciplinary and there's a focus on humanities, but our humanities are broadly defined because our humanities program of this three semesters includes all four divisions, the arts, the letters, the social sciences, and the natural sciences. So core one is in the fall semester of the first year, and I'm just briefly gonna go over this because there's another session later, um, I think later today, uh, is taught by 15, 16 of our Scripps faculty representing those four divisions. Lectures are together, and then you break out into small discussion sections every week, two times. And each three years, there is a, um, a changing of the topic per se. And currently we are in a, a session that is called Histories of the Present, colon, Truth. And so it is all about truth taught by faculty in four different divisions. Then we move into the second semester, which is our core two, which are interdisciplinary courses, either team taught or singly taught, that build upon the theme of truth. I'll give you just as a quick example, a course that I used to teach as a psychologist with somebody in the French department who is a cultural studies, French studies scholar. And we developed a course called Communities of Hate. And it was about genocide. And what we did is we looked at genocides across time and across place in terms of the political, the economic, the social, the cultural, the psychological, trying to understand how is it possible that genocides have occurred in the past and more importantly, how is it possible that they continue to occur? And so these are the kinds of topics that would come up in core two classes. And then in the fall of the sophomore year, the second year are core threes, which are singly taught in which they are project based on many, many topics from media to economics, to science, to humanities. And the project based because what they're intended to do is become a transition to your senior thesis, but not in your major. And the reason and the way we do this is by project based students generate an idea, they figure out a way to study it, they do that research and study it, and then they present it. And that's the same process three or two years later that they're going to use for their senior thesis, but now they're going to be doing it in their major. So what does the core do? Again, back to these kind of values of a liberal arts, it challenges people to think critically, challenges them to look at unexamined assumptions, helps people not to be afraid to change their minds and question their viewpoints and question other people's viewpoints. 
began to articulately learn how to speak and write about one's own views. It's pretty easy sometimes to figure out one's views, but then how to be persuasive and how to communicate them others is a skill that can be a lifelong learning skill, um, as I well know. What the core also does is it sets the groundwork for the disciplinary study. So it serves as a foundation for the major, which is what you do declare in the sophomore year. That's where you're gonna go into depth and range about a particular topic and or two topics. We have students who double major, we have a major and minor, we have majors and two minors, all variations. Students must major in one thing and beyond that they can do what they want. And that leads into the thesis, which is, as I said, the senior project required of all students, intentionally so, in which within the major, they do, they develop a hypothesis or a thesis. They figure out how to study it over a semester or two semesters. They do that work. They generate a written paper, an independent written paper, and then they present their work. We celebrate these senior theses by a wonderful day called Capstone Day, um, in which students present their work to the community, where faculty and staff and students come and listen to the students. And it really serves as a modeling for first years, sophomores and juniors who get to come and see what our seniors have accomplished. You may be thinking right now, how are you going to do that this semester? We have been spending a lot of time thinking about that and we are going to have a virtual capstone day. Students are doing five to seven minute TEDx like talks and we will have it on the same day as we normally have capstone day, which is Wednesday, May 6th. You are probably will be able to go in and look at some of these and students will present and we will have dialogues and we'll have questions and we'll have faculty panels engaging. So it won't be anything that we have done before but it will be an event that we are all looking forward to. I will jokingly say um, that at the end of the day, we always have a student faculty soccer game. <laughs> well, that is gonna be a lit more, little more difficult, but we the faculty have decided we're gonna pass the soccer ball around in some sort of video <laughs> progression to at least give the sense of celebrating the end of the day. So in addition to those two bookends, I just wanna highlight just a couple more things. We have a wonderful study abroad program. 60, approximately 60% of our students study away. That is a very high number. And what's most important, it's not simply a high number. We don't have a cap on the number of students who can study away. Many schools say, you know, up to 50% and you have to apply and you have to be accepted. You have to meet the criteria of the programs, but we really encourage as many students as possible to do off-campus study um, if they're interested in doing that. We have a fabulous undergraduate research mentoring program. This is something that is just so critically important. We see education and our academic mission inside and outside of the classroom. Research one-on-one -on -one with faculty, in labs, with other students is just essential, whether it be in the languages, whether it be in the traditional science or social science, in the art lab. This is going on across the divisions. We have funding that we um, provide for students. We have some support during the summer. We have support during the school year. And this kind of one-to-one -one relationship is essential. And when, you're, when students are thinking about applying to graduate school, what we hear from graduate schools over and over again is, your students came in already having done what we're teaching them in the first year of graduate work. So it's really important that this is a highlight of a student's um, time at Scripps. Lastly, just let me highlight the support that I think is so critical and important at Scripps College. We have academic advising. So every student has a faculty academic advisor. They come in with that. When they switch to the major, they switch to somebody within their major. The faculty have chosen to be at Scripps College. They want to be at a liberal arts college working with your students as much as your students are deciding to attend Scripps College. We have one-on-one -on -one in interactions. We have long-term developed relationships with our students. Um, I just the other day received two different emails from folks who had graduated years ago and were filling me in on how their families were coping with the pandemic. Uh, so faculty see these relationships as not simply a four-year kind of relationship, but much beyond that. It's, it's almost a three-dimensional relationship among students and faculty. The relationship is over time and maintains itself. Um, we have 
tutoring, and um, we can go into more questions over time, but we have tutoring available for all students, not if they're only having troubles, but if they just want some more assistance, and that's provided by our Dean of Students office in a free way to all students. We have a language lab for help with the languages. We have the math spot, which helps with math. We have a writing center that is available with three faculty staff positions and many student peer mentors to help with writing as the students progress through their four years. Um, and we also, through our Dean of Students Office, and I'm sure you'll hear more about this in other sessions, have what's called the Primary Contact Dean, which is a Dean of Students for co-curricular and residential life issues that is a one person who you have throughout your four years. So I can't, I can't say it any more strongly, we're a high touch place, intentionally so. We want to engage with your students. They will not be a number, they will be a name regularly and always. And then last, let me just touch on the issue of a women's college. We are proud to be Scripps College, the women's college within the Claremont Colleges. And I've thought long and hard about this over my 28 years. Uh, I would be, I just, I couldn't imagine myself anywhere other than a women's college. I didn't go to a women's college as a high school student or a college student, but I would never leave a women's college. I have found it to be just a fabulous environment and place. And I think a lot about why and here's, here's one of my thoughts, and then you can ask more questions later, but 20 years ago, 15 years ago, what folks used to say is the reason that women aren't paid equitably, the reason that we don't see as many women in Senate and the House of Congress and in government, the reason that we don't see um, women in the highest positions in power are because not as many women are um, getting college educations and they're not being educated as much. But for the past 15, 20 years, more women go to college than men. So maybe you could argue that they need to be out of college longer, but I think we've now had this ratio of more women going to college than men for far too long to explain that as the reason for what we still see as inequities. And so I think it's important that Scripps helps women not find their voice, but develop their voice, become in charge of their voice, be speakers. They also, Scripps provides all leadership positions to Scripps women. Um, and it's not a competitive process in that way. But what I will say makes Scripps so wonderful and unique is we do this within a co-educational environment. We're not cloistered in a way that then says, now go out into the world and pretend like there's all women out there. We are co-educational. There are all kinds of men and women in our classes. But there's a way at Scripps that puts the women in charge and puts them in a way of feeling responsible. And so, you know, what it does is it, it questions the hegemonic idea of gender. And so I think that's what's so important about Scripps as a women's college. Okay, so let me can start to move to my conclusion. And in doing that, I am going to make my own decision to switch from dean to parent. As I told you, I have twins. We also have an older daughter. And in making decisions about college, there are no set answers, but I'm going to give you advice anyway. Uh, first and foremost at Scripps, academic matters. There, we are fabulous. We have a phenomenal academic mission. I will answer any questions that you have about that. I think it's just a great place. But so many other things matter as well. Happiness matters, as I said earlier about the research. And happiness matters for the students who are attending college. Challenge matters, being challenged in a way that's um, commensurate what you, with what you want to have in terms of your challenge. Struggle and growth matter, and that's what happens when kids go to college. It isn't always gonna be easy. There's a struggle, but that struggle leads to a growth, and that's what we want our children to do. Support matters, not simply from you and the family, but from what the institution provides to the students. Friendships matter who you align with while you're at college and form, right? I'm assuming many of you family members out there still have some of your closest and dearest friends today from college. It matters. And then what I will say as most important is fit matters. And for all of those students who are listening to this, what I want you to do in your college process is listen to your stomach, your gut, that thing inside of you that says, this could be my home away from home. I could imagine spending four years here 
and finding this to be exciting and challenging and wonderful and stressful and great, but it, it seems right for me. Don't ignore that, whether that's scripts or anywhere else, don't ignore that, that gut feeling that you have. All right, so in conclusion, I really am concluding now. Scripps focuses on providing our students an exceptional experience. It is a place where you will be able to grow both academically and personally in an environment that is supportive and challenging. I look forward to you listening to your gut and hope that your gut tells you that Scripps is the place that you choose to be your home away from home. Now I am open to questions and uh, a dialogue with any of you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, I really appreciate your comments and I know our attendees do too because we've gotten a lot of great questions while you were chatting and talking. Um, so I think one of the places I was hoping to start in terms of the questions that we've been seeing is just what the relationship looks like between faculty and students at Scripps. So like how often are students meeting with their advisor? Is the, are the classes pretty small and intimate and discussion based? So what does that relationship look like between students and the faculty at Scripps? Okay, absolutely. Uh, so I don't think there's an answer, so I'll be really clear about that. There are varied answers. So academic advisors, as soon as your student comes to campus in their first year, they immediately in orientation have sessions with their academic advisors. And then academic advisors do things differently. Some meet with them on a more regular basis. Some have email exchanges. They definitely meet with them again as they're registering always for classes. That is where the kind of the, the key is about working on the academic program. And then what I would say is it becomes a lot up to the student. We have so many students. I serve as an academic advisor for a small number of students. I love it. And um, partly I'll reach out, but partly they'll reach out. And it may be to have a serious conversation about what are the next classes I want to take or it may be meeting at our Motley Coffee House just to chat. And both of those are happening regularly between faculty and student and student advisees. Going into the question of what do our classes look like, my answer again would be varied. We have very small classes with you know, five or six students per classes. And then we do have some larger intro level classes that have you know, maybe 30 or 40 students. Now, I realize that when you're talking about research universities, that was not what you thought I was going to say about big classes, but those are big classes for us. The majority of our classes are 15 or students or so. Students, uh, yes, there are some lecture classes, but even lecture classes are about engagement. There's lectures and there's questions and there are answers. And then for many, many of our classes, they are discussion based. There's readings that the faculty member is working through with the students. They're engaging, they're providing information, and then they're pulling them back and saying, what do you think about that? You know, so core one is an example. You might have thought about, well, why are you having all of the first year class sit in a lecture hall? We, the faculty, thought long and hard about this. And what we realized is there was no common academic um, experience. And so we thought, what if we created a common academic experience, all first year students would hear the same lectures, then would split up two times a week in small, small discussion groups with the same faculty member over time, how will that work? And I can tell you it's been a huge success. When you walk into the commons where people are eating in the fall semester, you will walk by tables and they will be talking about core. It may not always be positive, but they are talking about core. They're discussing what they heard in the lecture. They're questioning what they talked about. And so even when you start talking to sophomores and juniors and seniors, they will constantly go back to, do you remember when we studied Foucault? And we'll get questions from the other campuses, the, the faculty from the other campuses who say, wait a minute, why, how do your students all know about Foucault or Descartes or whatever it might be? So the classes will be quite varied from lecture to discussion to every hybrid in between from six people to maybe 30 or 40, but really they are, the typical would be something like 15, 12 to 15 students, a hybrid of discussion and lecturing or engagement. And that's really what our classes are about. Awesome, so you also mentioned our um, connection to the other Claremonts. 
And we've had a couple questions about that. So um, are students able to major off campus and at Scripps at the same time? And then also, are there students from the other colleges actually taking classes at Scripps? So is it a one way where Scripps students are just doing all the going out? Or is it more of a two way street? What does that actually look like? So I'll do one and then the other. So in mm -hmm. terms of majoring, every student must have one major minimum. That mm -hmm. major can be at Scripps or that major can be at one of the other colleges. It does not matter. So for example, I often will supervise as a social psychologist, Scripps students who want to major in sociology. As mm -hmm. I said, Scripps, we don't offer sociology. We offer lots of things that the other colleges don't offer, but we don't offer sociology. Pomona and Pitzer offer sociology. So if one of our Scripps students wants to major in sociology, then what she still has is an academic advisor from Scripps College. As I said, I've done that as a social psychologist, kind of being the close, closest aligned to sociology. The students still need to have two senior thesis readers. They um, normally will have one Scripps reader and one off-campus reader, but they can get, with my approval as the dean, two off-campus readers. Uh, and so that's one example. Um, there, there are other types of majors that are off campus. The thing I will say again, just to be clear, as I said, transparent, if Scripps College offers the major, students must major in that at Scripps College. And I'll give as an example, um, political, political science. It's called a number of things across the Claremont Colleges, but it's still politics. So a student who wants to major in politics can't major in international relations at CMC because those in essence are the same major but they just have a different nomenclature. But as I said, they absolutely can take classes at the other colleges that will satisfy requirements at Scripps. Okay, and the second part of the question was, sorry. Laura. Are there students from the other schools coming and taking classes at Scripps or is it more of a one way out? Uh, so yes, so we keep track of this at the at the dean's levels of the Claremont colleges of students, Scripps students taking classes at the other colleges and other students taking classes at Scripps College. And it's, yes, it is absolutely a two-way stream. And part of this is just the normal classes, but part of it is what we offer. Students will come to ours for, for example, we're the only Claremont College that offers the language of Italian. So any Claremont College student who wants to take Italian will do that at Scripps. We are, we are the lead college of music. And so we get students from all, not Pomona as much, they have their own, but all of the other colleges taking music at Scripps College. And art is a big, what we call an import. So we keep track of imports and exports. And we do have lots of exports because we encourage exports, which means Scripps students taking classes at the other colleges but we also have a very high number of imports as well. So it, it is a two-way stream. Wonderful. Um, so we have a couple questions about, for students who might be undecided, or we know that a lot of students, I know this from reading applications, we have students who come in with a lot of different interests and they're not quite sure how that's all gonna work and how they're gonna end up in a major because maybe they don't have it figured out yet, which like newsflash, that's wonderful. We love it if you don't have it figured out yet. Oh. Um, but Amy, for students who are coming in maybe undecided, mm -hmm. what does that um, advising process look like? And can students take other classes at the same time they're taking core, or is it just core in the first couple semesters? Got it. Great questions. So like Laura said, I am a huge advocate of undecided. Um, I think that it's great when that student knows I'm coming in and doing this, but sometimes they limit their options because they only start doing those things and they don't they, they just don't take some classes that they might want to. So I'll give you my academic advising advice. And as I tell students, I give advice, they can take it or leave it. But take intro level classes in your first couple of semesters. That's the way you decide. And the way you decide is maybe you take an intro site class and say, oh, I thought I was going to like it. And I don't really like it. Or you take an intro anthropology and you say, I didn't think I was going to like it. And I really do. And so that's why you want to take intro level classes to just, what do I think I might be interested in? What do I even not know what something is? Mm -hmm. So that goes into the second part of the question that was posed. So every student takes four classes each semester as a full load. 
Now, there are some students who will go down to three for various reasons, and there will some students who will take five. Those are both considered full as well. But the norm is four classes per semester, mm -hmm. over eight semesters. Um, to graduate, you need 32 credits, so four over every semester. The core is one course out of the four. So in the first semester of a first year, there is one course that's required and three other courses where the student gets to decide in consultation with their academic advisor. What they're deciding between are two separate things. How do I want to fulfill my general education requirements? And how do I want to decide on what I want for a major? And sometimes those can overlap. Like if I want to think about being a foreign language major and I need to take the third semester of French, that could help do both. Sometimes they don't. But let's imagine one of the things about our general education requirements is in among all the things that we require, we require one natural science, one social science, one letters, and one art. And so if you take intro level courses, oftentimes while you're thinking about, will this be something I'd like to major in, it's also satisfying a general education requirement. So that's what advising helps a student do is navigate and think about holistically, how do I wanna think about my fall and my spring? How do I wanna think about my major and my general education requirements so that by the end of my sophomore year, I will be able to declare my major. So when we think about the bookend to all of that, which is thesis, um, we have a question, which I think is a great one, which is for thesis, is it just a paper or are there other ways that students can fulfill thesis, maybe in a performance or something that's more based in research? What have you found are some, some different ways that students can fulfill the thesis requirement? Yeah, it's a great, great question. So there is a written independent piece of a thesis that is required for every student, but that independent written piece differs tremendously by major. So for example, let's talk about studio art. Studio art, the students are creating art and then they have a full show of the senior thesis projects. They, it's put up in the Williamson Art Gallery and, and folks across the campus go and see, but they also write an independent piece of work. Dance does a similar, similar way. Music does a similar way in performances and generating within the arts themselves. Science, social science, research is being done regularly, data collection, but it ultimately culminates in a written document. So across the board, there are multiple different ways. There are project-based, there are lots of ways of doing it. And what I would say is it can be unique to a student because students generate their own independent senior thesis, as long as it fits within the major requirements, they can be really varied, innovative, and creative ways of completing a thesis that will co be complemented by a written document that goes along with it. Wonderful. And for folks who are interested, you can see past Capstone Day um, schedules online, and I'm sure we'll be put, putting the one for this year online. But it's one of my favorite things to do is to go and look at all of the cool thesis topics that our students are talking about. And if anyone wants to see how to on um, how to access those, just send me an email, uh, and I'm I'm happy to to give you all that link because it's all um, cataloged in our Claremont College's library system, which is pretty cool. So, and uh, I would really say they are truly impressive. I and mean, when you see these theses, it's not simply, it's two things. The work that they've completed is just, they are masters of this work. They are the experts. But then they present and they're eloquent and they're, they're smart and they're creative and, and people in the audience are asking questions and they are just up there answering them. Boom, 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 boom. It's, it's, it's what we expect, but it's also very impressive. Amy, do you think that that moment, Capstone Day, and the things that we see as our students sort of move towards commencement is informed by the fact that we're a women's college, that that growth in eloquence or inability to communicate, how does the women's college part of our identity impact the academic experience? Well, I think it's a number of ways. And uh, things that I mentioned earlier, I think one is that it's, um, developing one's voice and I really am clear I think our students when you see when they are coming in they are phenomenally well achieved so it's not that they don't have a voice but what happens during their four years is just 
um, developing it even more. But I think what I have found over my time at Scripps is that content becomes something important to students over the four years. Uh, that is, where you might not have thought about it from a women's perspective, now whatever you're writing upon, you might look at the difference and disaggregate it by gender, or you might have a different take on it than you would have earlier. And, and I'll give an example because I have always found this to be such a pivotal learning experience for myself about a women's college and the differences. So I don't know, five or six years into my teaching career at Scripps, um, a colleague of mine passed away at Harvey Mudd, who was a social psychologist. And at the last minute, their dean of faculty came to me and said, could you teach the social psychology class that this faculty member was going to teach? And I said, oh my gosh, I am completely booked. I don't know that I can do this, but I absolutely want to be supportive. We talked and talked and I said, okay, I'm just going to teach the same exact class that I'm teaching at Scripps. That was great. That was wonderful. What a realization for me. I was teaching social psychology at Scripps with students from the other Claremonts, and then I was teaching social psychology at Harvey Mudd. And the conversations, the discussion, the questions were entirely different. At Scripps, it was about how does this relate to um, theoretical questions? What about gender and how this relates to political action? How about this relates to job equity? And at Harvey Mudd, there, there was nothing wrong with it. It was, what is the mean distribution of the study you are talking about? What is the data behind what you are saying? And it wasn't about kind of the impact. It was about the process. There was nothing wrong with it. But I think that highlights something about scripts in a women's college. It's about how does it impact us? How does it impact society? How does it impact differentially within society? not simply about gender, but about all different groups. And I think because as a woman, we, are, we kind of admit that there is something about us that might be separate and different than what's going on in society, we're more cognizant of other forms of people and groups and identities that may be part of the discussion as well. I agree. I mean, we see that with our students who are tour guides and who work with us of just that amazing opportunity for growth. And, and, you know, sometimes it's hard to put your finger exactly on what it is, but it's a, it's a powerful experience. It is. Um, I know that you mentioned as a parent, you know, you're in this with your own family right now, you're experiencing all of the ups and downs. And we do have some questions um, that kind of hit a, a thread line, which was how to compare majors at different schools. If a student knows that um, they're interested in perhaps pursuing a particular discipline, mm -hmm. are there things that they should look for um, to assess if, if a particular department is a good match? Do you have a place where families can start if they can't come and maybe yeah. talk to a student in that major? Yeah, actually, it's a great question. And I think there are a number of ways. Uh, first and foremost is a website because what you can find out is what what is the major about that is what are the requirements for the major mm -hmm. and i'll give us an example psychology at scripts our psychology major is data driven that is you take statistics you take research methods that's very common across most of the psychology departments but some are more clinically based some are more applied based some are more theoretically based and so going onto the website and looking at what what is the what are the goals learning outcomes of the major mm -hmm. what are the requirements of the major and then if i were a student i really wanted to find out more about that what i would do is look at the faculty and look at what their scholarship is about because if you are a student who says i'll just keep using psychology but you want to major in psychology and you want to do child development you want to make sure that there is somebody who is actually doing developmental psychology and then you want to find out and do a little more research what kinds of projects within child development is this faculty member doing now what i will say is one more step if you're thinking about the claremonts because as i said it's not just at scripts the faculty that you can engage with so let's imagine you go and you find out that our child development person you were really interested in childhood autism and that's not what ours does. But if you actually look at the Claremont Colleges at CMC, there is a faculty member who does childhood autism. 
So if you're trying to figure out, does, is Scripps the right place for you? And does it have the right kinds of opportunities for you within the major you think you are interested in? Go to the website, look carefully, send me questions. I'm happy to provide any answers that I can. But if you don't find it before you've decided it's not there, be sure to look across the Claremont colleges because we have many students who work with faculty at the other Claremonts. Awesome. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and that just gets- When you're having fun. <laughs> I know, well, you and I could do this all day, but I'm sure our folks are like, we have other things we need to get to. Um, so when you sort of think of the relationship with the faculty and the students, and obviously the advising is a big part of that, um, are students engaging in an advising process before they arrive with faculty, or is that something that happens once they're here for orientation? Mm -hmm. um, what does that look like at the outset? So as students are thinking critically about, okay, so this next step is going to college. What does that relationship look like as students are sort of getting used to the Scripps environment? Yeah, it's a great question. And we really started at orientation. Um, although there is information that goes out to students, once you've accepted that you're going to be a Scripps student, Dean of Students and Dean of Faculty, we send out information. The Registrar sends out information. Um, and, but the connection between the academic advisor and the student really happens during orientation. We don't have students register for classes in the middle of the summer. Many schools have different ways of registering for classes. We like to individually meet with students first so that we can actually engage with them. But what I will say is I'm around all summer. Um, one of the, I, I miss terribly one being in the classroom, but two interacting with students um, on a regular basis. I interact more with faculty uh, who I love as well. Uh, but uh, if there are questions and I've been receiving them already, students that I, you know, had contacted me earlier in the process, students who had questions. I was just getting some questions about the intro level computing classes at, at um, Scripps from a student. I'm, I'm happy to give out my email address, but then also Laura can provide it in our hub so that you don't have to remember it. But she had said I would earlier, but if anybody wants to contact me, um, please do not hesitate. Uh, you can find me under the Dean of Faculty at Scripps College, but also my um, direct email is amarcusn at scrippscollege.edu. And as I said, that will be posted. You don't need to remember, but my name is Amy Marcus Newhall. It's a very weird one. It goes A Marcus N because that's the right number of characters. But you can also write to me as at Dean of Faculty at ScriptsCollege.edu. And I look at both of those emails and I encourage you, if you have questions, you're thinking about how to make a decision or you're made a decision and then you have questions that you're thinking about for the fall, I'd, be, I'd love to be in contact with you. Awesome. Thank you again so much, Amy. We really appreciate your time. And thank you to all of our uh, attendees for hanging in with us for a pretty long session. We did have a number of questions that maybe didn't directly relate to Amy's area of focus. So things about starting clubs or um, particularly the social life in Claremont. What I've done is I've screenshot all those questions and we will either be um, creating answers and probably pushing that out on Instagram or we'll do some follow-up videos that folks can just take a peek at. So everyone can keep an eye out for that. And Laura, just as a reminder with them, Friday we have a session in which we will have the president, myself, and the Dean of Students. And so some of those questions, if they would like to ask those on Friday, if they haven't gotten answers before, we will be available again on Friday. Yeah, thank you so much, Amy, for, for reminding me of that. And, and everyone keep an eye out for all the sessions that are coming up this week. We have um, sessions about campus life and different five college resources. All, a lot of our academic departments are going to be doing info sessions. So please do keep an eye out. We look forward to um, being in contact with you for the rest of the week. And thank you all so much for coming. Thank you very much. It's hard not to be able to see you, but I will, I will, I will be waving to you as if you are there in person. Thanks for attending and good luck with your decision making. Thank you.